Afternoon, everyone. I'm Robert Mead, and this is my colleague, Michael Palmer, and we also have Waylon Williams, who's uh, also from Aetna, who helped put this presentation together. <clears throat> I know the subject is um, marketing with big data, but we're going to go beyond marketing and beyond big data a little bit, um, just to confuse you a little, uh, but also because we have a very complicated industry that is uh, becoming more complicated with the transformation from healthcare reform and the marketplace. And just a quick background on, on our industry um, <clears throat> before we start the presentation. We are, um, in, healthcare is a two and a half trillion dollar industry. It is um, uh, chaotic, it's expensive, it is way behind financial services and retail in terms of the use of information technology. Um, and unlike consumer, uh, unlike uh, retail and financial services, the consumer is not empowered in healthcare. Um, it is, it is uh, a very consumer unfriendly space and I'll explain a little bit of that as we go through. And as a result um, of those two factors, the lack of uh, information technology to coordinate the industry and uh, a sort of a suppressed consumer um, and all the regulatory changes and the, all the money in it, it is an industry that's absolutely ripe for creative destruction. And um, as a 160-year-old company, we can um, live by the theory. I'm from Texas, um, and there's a theory down there that the only thing in the middle of the road are yellow stripes and dead armadillos. <laughs> so we can either change and transform ourselves and, be, um, and disintermediate our, intermediate ourselves and creatively destroy ourselves, or we can you know, be a um, recently deceased 160-something-year-old company. The changing environment, healthcare, again, is a two and a half trillion dollar industry undergoing a, a very significant transformation. And it's really, uh, you know, public policy and the political system often intervene in the marketplaces and certainly in the healthcare marketplace. And again, one of the things that, that policymakers and the politicians have done is, is, and a lot of other players in the system, is prevent the consumer from really engaging and taking over the healthcare system. Um, the theories vary, but, but one of the reasons is that a lot of physicians and a lot of uh, policymakers believe that if you made it purely the responsibility of the consumer to decide what healthcare to get and consume and, and pay for, they would, they would skip healthcare. They would, they would choose not to, um, to get care because they th would think it's too expensive. While that may be true, there's ways to deal with that. I just think one of the reasons healthcare is so um, expensive and so disjointed and so chaotic is because the consumer can't demand the level of transparency and service, and, and, uh, service experience they do in these other industries, in the healthcare industry. And um, we've got to fix that, and we are believers in consumerism, and we've invested billions of dollars, literally, in helping consumers understand how to think and act like consumers in the healthcare system when they are um, in a place, in a position to choose what kind of healthcare they should have or what they should pay for it. And um, we want to help them as patients be able to navigate the healthcare system more effectively. Healthcare, again, is chaotic, but it's expensive and it can be quite scary as a patient. Here's healthcare reform. Everyone's familiar with the Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare. And we supported health reform. We supported uh, an individual mandate. We believed as a company that one of the problems with the uh, insurance system and the healthcare system was that there were too many people uninsured, aside from being a moral and ethical uh, dilemma for this country. That distorts the commercial marketplace and the insurance marketplace. So we wanted to get people in the system. Um, um, we also supported a lot of the other elements of the uh, uh, Affordable Care Act, including subsidies for people who couldn't afford insurance. The problem with the Affordable Care Act, as it stands today, is it does nothing to control costs in the healthcare system. And effectively, it doubles down on the broken system at taxpayer expense. So those 20, 30, 40 million people that will come into the marketplace at taxpayer expense are coming into a broken marketplace where there's 30% of the two and a half trillion dollars is wasted and where consumers have little ability to control the price. There's also an explosion of technologies. Everybody who's anybody in technology wants a piece of the action in the two and a half trillion dollar industry that is not wired. So um, we're not on our own. Talk about uh, costs. Is one of the issues in there just addressing poor performance? And is, would that be a big 
large element. It is an element. I don't think it's that, that big an element. What the biggest issue is reimbursement, how, how health care is paid for. And CMS, the, the federal government, which runs Medicare and Medicaid, pays fee for service. So you get what you pay for. Doctors and hospitals are paid to perform services, order tests, perform procedures, um, administer um, therapies and drugs. Um, they are not paid to manage the outcomes or manage an entire population. And as a result, um, we get much more health care than we need in this country, and, and, and a lot of it is, is waste. Um, and that, that system is, is, is desperate and ready to change. The question is change to what? The theory we are working on as a company is the accountable care uh, model, where hospitals and physicians are paid to manage patient populations, and we provide them with the technology solutions, the risk management, and the membership, the patients, uh, and help them manage the outcome of the patient population, the entire population. We pay them uh, a reasonable profit to manage that population, so they don't have to do a test unless they think it's necessary. They don't get paid just to do things. They get paid to, to um, you know, make people healthier. And the system really wants to change, and CMS wants to change, and, and it's part of the Affordable Care Act. But in a two and a half trillion dollar system, there's a lot of inertia, and people are waiting for solid evidence that it's the right thing to do and the right time to do it. We think that evidence is there. Um, the inertia part is hospital systems have been running for years on this, on this theory and approach, and, and they need comfort that they can make it work. They're a lot like airlines. Um, a hospital system focuses on those last two seats. If you can fill those last two seats, you're gonna make money that day. If you can't, you're not. And, and unfortunately, that's the way it works. A business traveler would pay $2,000 to fly from New York to San Francisco, and the backpacker three rows behind was paying $200. Once price transparency came out, that didn't work very well. So the healthcare system's a lot like the airline industry uh, back then, and it's, and it's changing. Um, and I believe, you know, with respect to analytics and big data that people talk about, a lot of it is hype and a lot of it is overblown and a lot of it's driven by consulting firms that want to get people like me and Michael to spend, and by the way, we're both former consultants, so we know this, um, to spend millions and millions of dollars to buy software systems and, and uh, technology solutions. But the fact is, big data is going to change everything. And in my career uh, in the utilization of research, it started off in politics and, and trying to win campaigns. Um, and we sort of took that discipline to the corporate universe. But research back then was about getting people to tell you what they thought they were going to do through focus groups and, and opinion surveys. And then with point of sale technology and, and other uh, technology in, in stores and such, you could see what people were doing. The real trick with analytics is, and predict, predictive analytics is to figure out what people are going to do. And that is the big breakthrough in the way that companies like us need to use analytics. So um, from our perspective, big data, we have, um, when we complete this acquisition, we'll have 24 million members and we'll serve another 25 or 30 million people in our other lines of business. Uh, we have massive amounts of data about people their healthcare status, their healthcare utilization, their pharmacy utilization, all kinds of things. Um, and we have um, literally hundreds and hundreds of brilliant mathematicians who work for us. They're called actuaries. Um, we are trying to change that model um, to uh, an analytics model and use their talents and capabilities to predict how people are going to behave. Because one of the biggest changes in the healthcare system um, under, a for, under the Accountable Care Act is that we will no longer be able to underwrite an individual and small group marketplace. And that just means that if you want insurance, we'll sell it to you. And we can only charge three rates, three band levels. So right now, one of the reasons we supported reform is the individual market doesn't work. You can only buy insurance if you really don't need it. When we think about big data in our business, again, we're thinking about, about the fact that we can't underwrite any longer and we can only charge certain rates. So our obligation as an insurance company is to build a balanced risk book. If Aetna goes out and attracts too much you know, adverse selection, high risk individuals, it could bankrupt the, country, the company. And if it bankrupts Aetna, 24 million people lose their insurance. That's not a good outcome. And every state we do business in watches this very carefully to make sure that never happens. 
So it's our obligation, not just as a publicly traded company to our shareholders, but to all our policyholders and the, the, uh, the system itself to make sure that we attract a balanced risk. So how are we going to do that if we can't underwrite and manage our risk that way? We're going to do it through marketing. We're going to do it through trying to make our products and services appeal to enough healthy people or people who, no matter what their health status is, are engageable. So if they have hypertension or if they have diabetes, they're willing to do what it takes to manage that condition. That's, if you get enough of those people in your book of business, you can, you can withstand having the people who have really serious conditions or who um, choose not to manage their conditions. So that's going to be a big part of our lives in the next few years, is how we make that work as a company. The second piece of it is, once we get that membership, then what do we do with them, right? So we need to figure out instantly, through the use of, of, of data analytics, who we have, what their health status is, and what's the right level uh, of, of uh, engagement for them, to get them with a nurse case manager, uh, get them to a primary care physician for tests, or get them to a specialist for procedure. The fact that healthcare has been a non-consumer industry or, or not, uh, a not consumer friendly industry, our chairman and CEO, Mark Berlini, is a really, really progressive thinker in this area. If you want to Google some of the things he's said and done, it's amazing. He's, um, he's committed to making healthcare far more consumer friendly. And the story he always tells um, is he went to um, buy his daughter a sweater for Christmas at the mall. And she wanted a specific kind of sweater, so he found it, I think, at Nordstrom's. And just, you know, um, out of curiosity, decided to see, check out his Google Shopper app and see what it would cost somewhere else. So he scanned the barcode and it showed him, popped up the stores in the mall, other stores in the mall or near the mall that had the sweater and at what price. So he saved himself 30 bucks and he was very proud of himself. But he got back to the office and said, I want to do that for healthcare. Why can't we do that for healthcare? And that's what CarePass started to be. Um, and it's morphed a bit since we started, but what it is is it's, it's an online um, destination for you to manage all of your healthcare information, data, and apps. So a lot of popular apps, you'll be able to plug them in, and we'll curate them and recommend to you which ones are, are, are right for you. Or, so, you know, there's, there's hundreds of thousands, millions of healthcare apps now, and we own one of the best of them, which is called iTriage. But we'll, we'll curate these apps and help you select the apps that are right for you, and we'll coordinate them so that, that they share data with each other. And they'll share, uh, you'll be able to, to share the data with your personal health record and with your nutritionist or your physician or anyone else. Um, and it's designed to make healthcare and, and, and navigating the healthcare system and managing your own health and wellness as convenient as other parts of your life. And, um, it, believe me, it is a massive pain in the neck to figure out how to do it because the healthcare system is disjointed and not coordinated. And the toughest part for us was not only getting, figuring out which apps to have on there and making them connect, was making them connect to our own platforms because we have, we process, you know, we'll soon process 500 and 600 million claims a year and we build massive industrial strength platforms that can handle those claims with minimum uh, you know, fewer than, uh, less than one half of 1% uh, mistakes. So we, um, our platforms are huge, they're complicated and they're expensive. And we had to figure out a way while protecting personal health information to get people to be able to interact with their personal health information and these, um, uh, these other, uh, this other data in the, mater in the, uh, the apps in a seamless, convenient way. And so that's, that's CarePass and we're gonna launch it um, again this summer and uh, we're really excited about it because uh, we've, we've invested, again, billions in all of this over the years. We started with the member payment estimator, the personal health record, then the member payment estimator, which was meant to give uh, consumers transparency into the prices in the healthcare system so that you would know if you banged up your knee skiing at Stratton next week, you could go, you could figure out where to go get an MRI and you, know, you could get an MRI three blocks from each other, price differential, you know, six hundred dollars to eighteen hundred dollars. So in no other industry would a consumer pay eighteen hundred if they could get the exact same product for six hundred somewhere else. The real reason that healthcare hasn't been a consumer industry is because the consumer feels like it's the government's money or it's Aetna's money or their employer's money. It's not really theirs. Fact is it is theirs, right? 
because uh, if you have employer-based insurance, it's, we consider it compensation. When we pay Wayland's um, health care premiums, he pays 40 percent and we pay 60 percent, but we count it as his compensation. He may not think about it that way, but it's pre-tax comp. And then he pays out of pocket for everything else. If you're a taxpayer and you're in Medicare, obviously the more you overconsume, the more the Medicare program costs and that, that cost is borne by all the taxpayers. So health care is very much of a commons, but you're exactly right. Because people didn't think it was their money, they didn't worry about it. That was one problem. Second problem is, as an industry, we've done a lousy job making that transparent to people. In the last 10 years, what has happened is that um, provi uh, the plan sponsors, the big employers, have pushed more and more of the cost for health insurance onto their employees. And now we're catching up with things like CarePass and the member payment estimator. We're giving people that transparency so they can think and act like consumers. And they can, they'll do the right thing. They'll see that, wow, if I, if I have the test here, it's gonna cost $1,800. The same test across the street is $900. I'll go there. So it, it will work, it's just gonna take time. How are you guys trying to engage people that are previously unengaged about their health? I mean, I see this as something yeah. that I could see a lot of people that are the 25 invincibles, you know, using this a whole heck of a lot. Right. But the 60-year-old smoker doesn't really know what an app is and, and really, you know, I mean, we all know that 80% of the healthcare costs are incurred by 20% of the population. Right. So those are the kind of people that I would want to be reaching out to, and right. I don't see that as being a great engagement right. tool. Maybe I'm wrong, but right. I, I just... It seems like this is the kind of demographic it's more geared towards. It's a great question. I think our answer is that, you know, time is our friend from a demographic perspective. Um, and, you know, if you look at the, at the Internet and mobile utilization, um, the, the, the hockey sticks among people 55 and above, um, obviously your generation doesn't shop any other way and doesn't consume any information any other way. So you're always going to do that. And that'll be your minimal expectation for your relationship with us. Um, but you're right, that is, that is a big challenge in this country um, and the costs associated with it. And our view is that, again, go back to the use of data analytics to figure out who our members are and what their health status is and condition and getting them into the right level of, of, of care management. So we get a nurse on the phone with them, we get them to a primary care physician, we get them to the right treatment program. We can see through our data whether they're, fulfilling, they're refilling their prescriptions on time. If they're not, that must mean they're, they're not taking their drugs. We can see you know, with their test results if they're getting their hypertension under control. And we can work with them. But the answer is, you're right. It's, it's a constant battle to get people to, to do the right thing and to do what is, they know is right that they resist doing. And, and well, it's a bit of we're an never going to solve that. Yeah, it's a bit of an and strategy as well. Right, so this works for one subset of the population, not necessarily just the youngsters, but people who are familiar and comfortable with that technology. You know, we've got other programs that we work on with the Medicare population to help them prevent falls that have nothing to do with this. So you've got a, you know, a DVD and or a class in a, in a, uh, a community center where they're taking Tai Chi to try to improve their balance and their acuity of what you know, the surroundings are and that sort of thing to, in order to prevent falls, which is one of the bigger challenges that people have as they get older is the fear of falling and then once you fall you break a hip you know 50 percent of the people die within a year of that experience so you know preventing the fall is a big deal uh, for the older population but m many grandmas aren't going to use this right they, they might choose a different medium so it's an and strategy of all different kind of engagement tactics uh, based on the populations we serve you have to be creative and their caregiver may use it their daughter or son yeah that's you know, right to keep track of her appointments and medications. So a tenant of accountable care is uh, shared decision making. Right. Should an Aetna rep have a seat at that table? With the doctor and yeah. the patient? <coughs> no, but Aetna technology can. And, you know, first of all, we can't be that omnipresent. We can't have somebody everywhere. But as part of accountable care organizations, and we have a partnership with Cleveland Clinic, where we do embed nurses in uh, the hospital or the doctor's office, Aetna nurses, to help with the, um, the adherence and the, and the, and the, and the um, in the care, um, it, uh, the you know, keeping people on the therapies, but but that's one of the reasons we're going with the technology is to have that personalized technology available. And you've seen people go into doctor's office with shoe boxes full of files and materials, or they go with their their if they're a caregiver, they go with their elderly parent to their and they take two boxes full of prescriptions to sort out what's she on, what's she taking, and is this right? And I think anybody who has an elderly parent's been through that, where you've had to go to their, 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 their medicine cabinet and you look up and you say, oh my God, 
are they really taking all these things? Are they taking it at the right time? So a lot of it is all about that, is, is putting, you know, our brand promises, we put the power of health in your hands. And it's really about this thing. It's really about the mobile, the mobility and the convenience of that information and that support and that advice and that help um, that really gets people engaged. And when it comes to the private provider's compliance with information like this, we, we know sometimes more expensive means better quality, but not always. Right. So what would be the incentive for somebody who's charging 1800 for the same MRI that somebody else is charging 300 to have that information on this app? Well, guess what? The, one of the biggest reasons there's no transparency, transparency in healthcare, and let me say this for the recording device, is doctors and hospitals. They have fought transparency tooth and nail. And the biggest hospitals with monopoly positions or oligopoly positions fight it harder than anyone else. Our job as an insurance company is to fight back and to get them to publish their prices and make menus available to, re to consumers. I would say healthcare today is like walking into a Best Buy with no signs on any of the aisles and no prices on any of the products, <laughs> right? So you go in to buy a flat screen TV and you're like, oh, okay. You look at that, oh, that looks fine. And, you get it out and you put it in your cart. And while you're standing there, somebody walks by and pushes, puts a bunch of other stuff in your cart. And you're like, well, I don't need that, do I? Oh yeah, you really need that. So you go to the cash register to check out and they scan everything, but no prices come up. And you say, well, what's that TV cost? And do I really need that DVD? And what's that cost and what's that cost? Just give us your credit card, don't worry about it. And, and you say, well, but I, I don't know if I can afford that or need it. And they, and they say, don't worry, Aetna's paying for it. That's healthcare, and that's why it's so screwed up. So, as it as it, you know, as transparency comes into the marketplace and people have those tools and information, will they always say, "Well, I want to save Aetna money, or I want to save my employer money"? Not necessarily, but at least they're aware, and that awareness leads, we think, will lead to more competition among hospitals and providers to to, to compete on quality and convenience, and not just price. Yes, ma'am. I know that my stomach hurts, but I don't know what's right. wrong with it, and I don't exactly. know what tests are needed. Right. So how how do you get customers to really look into the cost differential when they don't know what they're looking at? I triage. So <laughs> we bought this company called I triage that was in, was created by um, some emergency room clinicians, some doctors, and it is the number one app in healthcare. Nine million downloads. Check it out. It's free. It's um. It's a phenomenal piece of technology. It helps you symptom check. It gives you access to very high quality medical information and advice. Helps you find a doctor. And when we come out with our new version of it, you'll be able to find a doctor in our network, in your plan, and book the appointment online electronically, put it in your calendar, and they pay know for it. How much things it costs. They know exactly what it's gonna cost and pay for it. For you, out of pocket. Now, that, that sounds like, well, why the hell didn't you do that before? We had to buy somebody much smarter than us, <laughs> number one. And number two, then we had to teach them how to access our systems. And that's why it's taken two years. But um, anyway, it's that kind of thing is going to radicalize healthcare. One of the main reasons people, as I said earlier, the main, main reason people buy health insurance is because they want prepaid access to our network discounts. And they want help in navigating all that. So somebody pays that bill, somebody negotiates with that hospital, and somebody sorts out um, the complexities. So you know we need to do a better job of that. And accountable care is meant to take the patient out of the middle. And you can see this slide. Um, these are companies that we've acquired or built. And um, it starts with Aetna, which is obviously the health plan and, and risk management capability. We bought a company called Medicity, which is, has the largest installed base of health information exchange, hospitals and physicians. And basically, it's just a smart grid to exchange uh, patient information and data. And you think, well, wow, that's probably been around 100 years, hasn't it? No, it hasn't. Healthcare is way behind. They built something called INEX, which is, for all practical purposes, an apps store for hospitals and doctors to pull down um, technology and, and apps to manage the patient population and, and manage their practices. It's supported by Active Health, which is a company we've owned for about 12 years, I guess 10 years, that is a, um, a decision, clinical decision support technology company founded by physicians where all of the data that they provide and the, and the technology enabled advice they provide comes from the evidence base in medicine uh, to help doctors 
um, you know, doctors can't read 400 articles a week, but these guys do, and they keep doctors abreast of the latest uh, clinical data. Um, CarePass I talked about, iTriage I talked about, but those are the consumer elements to this ecosystem. So our theory is if we, if we connect the hospital, the physician, the insurance company, and the consumer and patient with the technology that talks to itself and each other, then we have the beginnings of an ecosystem that works. Yes, ma'am. I, I think uh, the industry is going through uh, a lot of uh, um, kind of uh, um, mergers and acquisition. Right. Uh, some are vertically uh, integrated, right. such as some insurers who own the hospital. Right. So is your company trying to do that? Yes, yeah, so we acquired all these companies. Our version of acquisition is our definition of our M&A strategy is we either want to own insurance plans to get bigger in our co core business of insurance, or we want to acquire um, related um, uh, st uh, strategies and, and businesses and capabilities that fit alongside of that. So all of these acquisitions were done with one thing in mind, to help drive the technology enablement of the system and help connect hospitals, insurance plans, and consumers more effectively. And then we've put them all um, together in such a way that, that that works. So that has been our strategy. One of our competitors bought 1-800-CONTACTS because they wanted to become more of a consumer products company or connect with consumers differently. And we didn't, you know, honestly, that, didn't, that wouldn't work for us. We, this, is, this is our chosen approach. And, you know, we've got, a, um, we've got again, a very visionary CEO who who is bound and determined to change the healthcare system. He, he had two major experiences with the healthcare system that sort of defined his existence. He's been in the industry his entire career, but, um, and it was in Killington, Vermont, about, uh, I guess about nine years ago, eight years ago. He uh, was skiing, he was an extreme skier. He hit a tree and broke his neck and his shoulder and his spine, and he's mostly paralyzed on his left arm. And he, um, he was in the system for the better part of a year and a half, I think 10 surgeries, all kinds of issues, very high level of pain and difficulty controlling that pain. So part of the story is that he discovered alternative and complementary medicine, you know, massage, uh, yoga, cranial sacral therapy, meditation, everything, and he's a big believer in that. The other part is he had this experience as a patient and how screwed up the healthcare system is and how unconsumer friendly it is and how hard it is on patients. That drives him. The second big experience he had is his son had a very rare and theoretically incurable form of cancer. He quit his job and lived in his hotel room for, in his hospital room for a year, and on his own, worked the entire system to help find a cure for his son, which happened. So his son's still alive. And he gave him one of his kidneys because um, uh, the therapy he had destroyed his kidneys. So he, he takes that experience as a patient and as a father or caregiver who found the complexity, the expense, the chaos, the unfriendliness and, and um, lack of coordination of the healthcare system. And that's what drives him personally. And so when, he, when we bought iTriage, when we bought Medicity, it was to fix those problems. Uh, Robert talked a little bit about clinical capacity exchange, and that really is the open table of healthcare and the idea of matching this available capacity, even perhaps at a discount. These big imaging machines, in the example you see here, you know, uh, where you've got to get a, you, you blew your knee out at Killington last weekend and you've got to go get some, uh, some imaging done on it. You know, first of all, nobody wants to do that, but certainly you don't want to pay more than you have to for it. And you could believe that paying more gets you a better solution here, but really is, it's a digital image of your knee. So to the extent that these are all more or less a com commodity, then it doesn't really matter. And to the extent that a machine sits empty for an institution, zero dollars are accruing. So 300 bucks or 600 bucks is better than zero. So the extent they're willing to discount their services when they've got an, a cancellation or an opening, this is the idea of matching supply and demand. And the imaging example is probably the easiest one. It's much harder when you've got a, you know, you've, you've been diagnosed with heart disease and you're going to have a heart attack in a year and a half and you want to figure out who's going to guide you through that experience. You really want to talk about quality and cost in addition. And this is, this is probably a little bit better at the, today at the the cost side of things more so than the quality. Now over time we'll make the, this using some of the big data that we've got. We can put you in a cohort with patients just like you with 3,000 clinical variables that say if you had COPD here's the patients that are just like you 
we can say, and by the way, here's the doctors that treated them and the outcomes that were achieved by those physicians. Maybe you should see one of these three physicians. That'll be a really different day in terms of treating really chronic disease. All the stuff in the middle is going to be harder. Most of the docs today get uh, rated on satisfaction. Did you like them? How was the wait time? Did they do a good job? How do you know? You're not a clinician. So the, 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 the rating, the star system is really difficult here. So this is, you know, this is one of the examples of, of trying to help give people uh, transparency into the healthcare system. Another thing we're doing with big data is around metabolic syndrome. Anybody familiar with metabolic syndrome? So it's these five factors, abdominal girth, blood pressure, glucose, uh, high triglycerides, and uh, cholesterol, low HDL, not high LDL. And if you have a combination of three out of five of those factors, you have what they call metabolic syndrome, which is a, raises your risk dramatically of, of heart disease, uh, stroke, diabetes, uh, chronic kidney failure, et cetera. So what we looked at, say, is can we look at uh, a population, we had about 85,000 people in this particular experiment, we could get good data on about 36,000 of them. They've been doing metabolic syndrome testing, which is basically a blood test as well as measuring your waist circumference and your blood pressure for two years running. So 6, 600,000 lab results and 18 million claim events allowed us to take a look at this population and come up with uh, individual histograms for predicting your risk at the individual level of getting metabolic syndrome in the next year. So across the top, you see the patient ending in number 62, male, 46, he's got uh, HDL, so low HDL and high waist circumference. His probability is 92% next year of getting metabolic syndrome. And, and as interestingly, you can see here that glucose is the next likely thing for them to get on the hip parade. So now you're going to a doc, you happen to have two factors, you don't have metabolic syndrome, you don't really know what these hidden risk factors are. With this kind of data at your fingertips, now you can say, I got to focus on these two, waist and HDL and glucose is my next worst problem. So I got to focus on it. So instead of saying I got to focus on all five or six factors, I've really got to get it down to just the two that I can do something about. So we, we think this analysis will help some of our large employee populations, if they have access to this at the beginning of the year, say what's the care plan you should be on this year to avoid getting metabolic syndrome in the next year and driving up your likelihood of having to stick yourself with a needle to keep your blood pressure sugar in check for the next 10 years or 20 years of your life. Now, interestingly, subject number two at the bottom here really has a much lower 40% probability of getting uh, metabolic syndrome in the next year, and, and really focusing on the two that they've got is probably a better investment of their time and energy. Glucose is next on the list, but it's 26%, relatively low risk of that. And this probably is a, you know, more about heredity than it is about you know, lifestyle and waist circumference and girth. So what we hope to do with this kind of big data analysis with these companies is to allow them to put really personalized intervention programs in for the individuals in the population. And as we are able to aggregate all this data and all these data points, we think this is going to drive a higher engagement of the population in their own health. We also have a genomics program very similarly focused to try to give people information about what their ultimate demise is. If it's going to be heart disease, and you got this metabolic syndrome graph back, and you know you're 1.6 times more likely to get cardiovascular disease than your peers, then maybe you'll actually, like me, start taking your statins. My doctor's been trying to get me to do it for a while. Like, oh, I don't like pills. Well, guess what? This kind of stuff can get you uh, motivated in, in different ways. Uh, interesting, I'll just leave you with a couple of things that we learned from the study. Um, we can actually do individualized prediction of this stuff, given enough data for a population that's relatively large. Um, interestingly, the most important factors are waist circumference and glucose. So if you're, there's a little tip for you for a, a random uh, Wednesday afternoon. If you're going to focus on two things, focus on waist circumference and glucose, because those are the two things that will drive you fastest to metabolic syndrome. They're also, uh, waist circumference is also the stickiest, it's the hardest to get rid of as we all fight the battle of the bulge. Um, surprisingly, the smallest positive impact, if improved, is blood pressure. Not to say you shouldn't watch your blood pressure, but in terms of metabolic syndrome, that would turned out in this research with this population to be less, less important. So, you know, as we look at the, um, these particular interventions, you know, how are we using big data? It's to try to help individuals get more engaged in their own health in, in many ways. And so hopefully some of these tools will be coming to a, a place near you soon.
Are, they, are you guys tying those numbers and the trends, uh, more importantly, to premium levels that you're charging the individuals? We are not at this point, although, you know, there often is a difference between smokers and non-smokers. That's about the most granularity that we have today. But I can easily see a future where, you know, we can use clinical data to do a better job of predicting what your health care costs are going to be. You know, one, one thing we're, we're using this for also is with these big plan sponsors. We were with uh, uh, IBM the other day, and they're very interested in managing their patient, patient population. And being able to show them, if they invest in these three programs, here's the bang for the buck. The reason glucose actually is the most important in terms of driving cost uh, in our research, you know, that we found that in the research, and we can give that to the IBM population and say, you really should focus on blood glucose as your number one th risk factor to manage next year in your population. Now, again, we'd have to run their data through the same kind of tools, but being able to give the employer, say, here's the things you should invest in in your particular uh, company to get the biggest bang for the buck in terms of lowering costs. Because, you know, the, the, the big companies co co you know, care most about, obviously, keeping their, their employees at work, keeping them healthy and productive, and keeping the cost, you know, the bill down for all, for all that as much as possible. Sure. About companies that are like 23 and me, and are you doing something in house that's similar to that, or are you looking at acquiring? Yeah, you know, we are doing a lot with partners. In fact, 23 and Me is our is our partner with along with a company called Inform DNA. Those are two of the partners we're working with in our genomics pilot. Again, the idea of having the individual member they opt into this uh, this uh, this uh, study. They're uh, obviously the data, their genomics data is not shared with us or their plan sponsor, but only between them and 23 and Me, frankly, and the and the uh, counselor, the genetic counselor. So the idea is they get the test, uh, it comes back to them, they get on the phone with a genetic counselor to help them interpret the results, because there's a lot of complex information that comes back in those kinds of tests. And so the genetic counselor is there as a way to help the patient interpret it and determine what to do. And then to the extent possible, like in my example, you know, cardiovascular disease is going to likely going to be my demise. All of my grandparents died from it and it's probably going to happen to me as well. So to the extent I can manage my cardiovascular disease, that's a conversation I can have with my primary care doc to say, what can I be doing to manage my cardiovascular health? Okay, get on the statins. What about blood sugar? What about your waist circumference? All the things that are going to deal with your, your, your cardiovascular health are going to be important. But yet we are partnering with smaller companies to help us do this because we can't do it all ourselves. And so to the extent the pilot goes well, you know, 23 meal get a, you know, a, a, big, a big chunk of work perhaps. And, you know, but we'll try to spread the wealth around we do it as much as we can with these little startups as well. Are we becoming more of a you know, epi epidemiological study group? And, and reality is we've got large plan sponsors that pay us a big chunk of money to manage their health care costs. Mm. And to the extent that we do a better job than United or Cigna or somebody else in helping them manage that cost and their productivity, their workforce, and keeping people at home and their families and that kind of stuff instead of in the hospital, we, we, we get better marks. So to the extent our health care programs are better than, that's one of the only differentiators we have, right? Uh, negotiating great network prices, with our volume and being able to provide great health interventions the, so that the big, you know, the big companies, even the small companies, can take advantage of those, those programs. So to the extent we can give those plan sponsors any information like this, and, and one of the goals, you'll see the other end of this is, you know, here, if you, fa if you this particular company focuses on wa waist circumference and or glucose next year, this will be the financial impact to your, your health care dollar. You know, and of course, that's means engaging the population of patients as well. This is an interesting idea. I'm sure Edna would like to think that their subscribers are the healthiest subscribers, but you kind of want to believe that you know, any good doctor can make any patient healthy, regardless of their insurer of choice. So, right. like, is that just in the, the research information is going to be part of the, the value added proposition? That I know? Yeah, I, I think so, and. and Robert Manchin, uh, Active Health, which is another company we acquired some time ago, and Active Health actually does this, this care gap analysis to says, it actually sends letters, emails, faxes, phone calls, whatever it needs to, to get the doc to engage and say, next time you see Charlie, you need to make sure you check his cholesterol because he's way out of range on the last lab results, and we, we see he's not taking any kind of statins. Yeah. So it's looking for these gaps in care electronically, again, in searching in this vast amount of data and trying to give the physicians as much information at the point of care as they can. But in reality, that has to happen the moment you show up in the door or beforehand. So we've got some enhancements to that called the care team suite that allows docs, especially in these ACOs, to proactively manage the population health. 
to say, I see here Charlie's not taking his statins because he hasn't refilled it in, in 90 days. It's time for one of my nurses to make an outreach call and or to send him more pills. I mean, there's, there's many ways to get this done, but there's a behavioral change aspect that we think physicians can probably drive better than we ever have, certainly better than employers uh, can as well. We have to wrap up because we have to give up the room, so we'll uh, be able to step out in the hall though for a minute if you have questions. Great. Thank Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it.